Okay, hello everyone. Um, thanks for joining our webinar on Qt 3D Studio 2.0 new features. During the session, if you have any questions, please submit them via the Q&A button at the top of the interface. Um, those questions will be answered at the end, but feel free to submit your questions during the session as well. This webinar will be recorded and you'll receive a copy of it delivered to your email account. I hope you enjoy and now I'll hand over uh, to our experts, Sami Makkonen and Domi Gorbabau. Over to you. Yeah, hi, my name is Sam Makkonen. I'm the product manager for the Q3D Studio in Qt company. And the focus of these, today's webinar is, uh, is the new features that we released in Q3D Studio 2.0 version. Um, but I'll go through also the short introduction on the, on the basic features of Q3D Studio if you don't have any, any previous experience on the tool or, or haven't in any, any previous presentations. Um, so let's focus on, on the 2.0 release content, uh, what has happened in the, in the Q3D Studio editor side, and also, of course, the biggest, biggest feature is, is the new Q3D Studio uh, runtime. And, and then we have also introduced uh, some new features onto the uh, data input uh, mechanism uh, for changing data between the Qt based application and the and the 3D user interface. And then shortly going through also the roadmap that we have uh, planned for the for the future releases and then a reminder how to get started with Q3D Studio. Um, if we start with the basics, so what is Q3D Studio? So it's a tool for creating 3D user interfaces or adding 3D content into the 2D user interfaces. So basically, if you have created 2D user interface with Qt or Qt Quick, then you can uh, use um, Q3D Studio to create 3D content animations and uh, interaction uh, into that application. Q3D Studio is not a 3D design tool as such. So uh, there's no functionality for creating uh, 3D models or, or uh, creating textures. So, uh, so these um, 3D design tools that are commonly in use uh, can be used to create the 3D content as such and, and then export it to FBX or Collada. Uh, formats and then import it into the Q3D Studio and, and then you can start creating the final look and feel in the Q3D Studio. Um, Q3D Studio has its own materials and post-processing effects for creating the look and feel for the application um, and of course these can be extended uh, as well so creating, creating new materials and effects is, is possible. And of course, uh, being part of Qt family, uh, one of its core features is the integration to Qt based application logic and, and making that e as easy as possible. Um, and of course, this tool is meant for, for different kinds of applications, whether it's in desktop or mobile or whether it's in embedded systems. Um, and of course, everything is uh, real time. Uh, rendering so, so uh, all the materials and, and all the functionality in the application is, is built for real-time rendering. Um, if we look at the editor improvements, actually we could hop into the tool itself. So, so we'll not, not look into the slides. So basically this is the Q3D Studio when you open, open it with an empty project. So there's the 3D view there's the property, uh, property pane, and and of course this might actually look a bit different based on on the kind of if you start this application first time because you can drag and drop these uh, panels so that you can uh, either dock them into a different part of the UI or you can actually take them out altogether and actually change into another screen. So you can build your own own. Uh, workspace uh, based on, on your liking. Uh, and all of these panels can be changed in location. Um, 
the inspector control shows the kind of the properties of each of the selected objects. In this case, there's a basic item, which is the scene. And the scene has uh, animation related uh, basic properties, which is uh, whether it stops the animation at the, at the end or whether it's looping or, or ping ponging the animations and, and whether it starts animating automatically and then whether you're using background and, and what's the background color. And then at the bottom, we have the project browser, which is basically all the assets that have been included into the uh, project. I have already added a couple of uh, items. So basically you can see that here's a 3D model and then there's a, a texture that is used in the, in the reflect, as a reflections texture. Um, but adding new stuff can be done here so that you in, uh, press the import assets button uh, to find your 3D models. And, and the other buttons are basically uh, built in content inside the Q3D Studio. So that for example, there are certain uh, basic, basic uh, 3D objects inside uh, the installation package and you can uh, add those into the project. Um, so basically when you want to import new stuff, um, you just find the uh, correct uh, folder on your file system and, and you can add, add FBX or Collider files. And then those will be edit, uh, added to the project browser. And then you can drag and drop content into the 3D view. Um, then we have the timeline view, and this is actually one of those new features in Q3D Studio in that sense that it has been totally rewritten. Of course, it looks pretty much the same as it used to be in the, in the earlier versions, but this actually enables us to uh, make the further development a bit easier for from our point of view. Um, so internally for us this is a big thing and for example the animation timeline and and the kind of uh, manipulating the animations and and doing some inline editing and and stuff like that will be added in the future releases now that we have have rewritten this this component um in the animation timeline there is no animations at the moment so um so animations can be added by clicking uh, the property panes, the stopwatch signs, so that, uh, for example, if creating a rotation animation that lasts two seconds, um, uh, can be done so that uh, you add a new, uh, new rotation value and it automatically creates the uh, rotation animation. And you can see it like this. Um, actually, let's uh, start adding uh, one of those items that I had uh, already imported into the, to the project. So you can see here that uh, the imported uh, 3D uh, model contains uh, the whole project and then it has these individual parts imported here as mesh files so that you can, for example, import only part of the 3D object or you can import the whole, whole 3D object. So, um, so now it brings everything that is included into the uh, 3D, uh, into the model file that was uh, imported. Of course, if you have kind of unnecessary stuff in the 3D model, so, so for example, there are some parts in the 3D model that are not visible in any, in, in any case of, of the application, then those could be removed in the 3D design tool, but those can be actually uh, also removed here. So that basically uh, removing uh, parts of the 3D, uh, model can be done here as well. So that for example, uh, this uh, 
small fan object in the jet engine model is something that is not visible in, in any part of the application. So we can then delete that part of the 3D model. Um, then in, with this model, you can see actually a common problem with the 3D, uh, 3D objects that, for example, the pivot points of the object are misplaced. Um, so that if you, for example, start rotating this, uh, it creates a rotation around the pivot point, but in this case, it's, it's a bit poorly placed. Of course, this can be also fixed in the, uh, in the 3D design tool, but it can be done also in the studio side. And actually one of those new features uh, uh, that we have been working with the 2.0 release is the kind of improvements into the different uh, uh, views. So we have uh, different views for the top view and, and left view. And these can be also uh, accessed with the keyboard shortcuts. So that pressing control and then uh, numbers from the keyboard so that one is always the camera view the scene default camera view, and then uh, the others, uh, for example, two is the perspective view. So, the, so this is easy way to change uh, into different views for aligning stuff and, and fixing, for example, the pivot points. Um, and always in the 3D view, so that, um, for example, if you are somehow lost in the view, then you can always press F, which brings the active object into the, into the window. So that, uh, so that if you are kind of not seeing the object fully, then you can select the object for, for example here and press F and you always uh, see the object in the scene. And if we start uh, fixing the pivot point issues, then we can, uh, select the object and, and then start uh, fine tuning the pivot locations so that uh, it will be in the correct place. And of course, using different views is helpful here so that you can, you can do the pivot point adaptation more easy. Um, and this way, uh, you get the animations correct. Um, then what you can start doing is, is the kind of the looking after the uh, look and feel of the object. So basically this is exactly how it was imported from the uh, 3D design tool. Uh, so that it has chance uh, basic materials for each of these uh, different parts of the model. And then you can, for example, start adding reflections so that uh, we can add specular reflection uh, to the casing. And then we have the other parts that have their own materials. We can either modify the materials individually so that uh, they are all using different materials, or we can use uh, reference material. So basically, for example, this fan part of the uh, uh, 3D object is now using its own material, but we can uh, set the uh, material type to reference material, and then we can select, uh, for example, the case uh, case material so that it, it actually uses the uh, same, same material. Um, and actually I have uh, already created uh, some of the tunings for, for this uh, object. So let's, let's remove the object that we brought. 
So here we have, have the same object and all the materials have now been applied. Um, there's no um, animations included into the into the oops it seems that uh, uh, I'm experiencing a demo effect so let's uh, launch the relaunch the application um, so here we have the uh, same object uh, now so that uh, all the materials have been applied correctly. And one thing to note is the, is the layer component here is that, for example, the anti-aliasing is applied to layers. So layers can be used to composite the UI uh, so that, for example, if you have some parts of the user interface that doesn't need the anti-aliasing, then those can be placed into different layer and then that layer doesn't have the anti-aliasing applied to that layer at all. And also the post-processing effects, so that, for example, if you want to introduce, uh, for example, a plume effect into the uh, view, then that is also applied to layers. So, so you can have different parts of the UI implementing some post-processing effect to implement a certain look and feel, uh, but then you can modify the different parts of the UI so that uh, they are not, the effect is not applied to all parts of the, uh, all parts of the UI. Um, And then um, we can view the uh, user interface by using the viewer. So, so there are preview buttons here so that you can look, uh, use the preview green button and you see the kind of the uh, user interface that you are creating. Uh, this viewer can be compiled to also for an embedded device so that you if you have a network connectivity in your uh, embedded device uh, then you can set this into the remote mode so that you can use the uh, uh, IP address from the uh, editor to connect to the to the viewer. So this is handy when you are developing a user interface to a, to a device so that you can immediately see uh, all the changes that you have done in the UI in, in the device. So let's actually add an animation to the, to the 3D object uh, so that we have something visible. Let's put a small animation there and when we look at the viewer then the animation is is ping-ponging uh, so because this was defined that uh, the animation is going back and forth and one of the new features in the Q3D studio is uh, profiling view so by pressing F, F10 or using the uh, using the menu, you can activate the uh, per performance analysis tool. For example, it shows the frame rate that you are getting. So, so this is the delta between the frames. So it's 16 milliseconds, meaning that it is it, 60 FPS uh, when running the animation. Then it also gives you basic information about the OpenGL version that you have in the system uh, and what what features are supported then also information about the system load when when running the application so these are the kind of the basic basic analysis for uh, for finding bottlenecks in the and uh, locating 
bottlenecks in the user interface. So that, for example, if you introduce some new post processing effects or you accidentally add, add stuff that is not visible in the UI, but it's taking a lot of processing power, then that can be found out with, the, with the, uh, this tool. It also gives you the list of the 3D objects that you have in the system uh, and, and the textures that uh, those are using. Um, so this is already getting quite technical information. So, so basically this is tool for, for optimizing the application by first looking at the uh, 3D design done with the Q3D Studio. And there's also really detailed information about the frame graph in the rendering engine itself, meaning the Q3D. So, so that you can get really detailed information about what kind of stuff is, is inside the rendering engine. Um, and you can also see all the data inputs um, so that uh, uh, you have allocated into the, in the presentations. But let's look at the data inputs in, in more detail. So this is, this is one of the new features that has been introduced in the Q3D Studio 2.0. And it's really handy tool for, for deploying to the target devices and, and looking potential performance issues. Um, so um, if we, uh, start looking into the to the one of the other new features the improved data inputs so basically data input is is a mechanism for defining values that are changing in the in the user interface and those can be then accessed from the cute based api the QML API, and I'll, I'll show how it looks from the API side, but let's first uh, create the uh, data inputs for, for these objects. So, um, and always objects can be duplicated by, by using the duplicate object. So, uh, so actually now I duplicated the uh, 3D fan object so that uh, there's the left fan and, and we can now uh, change the name to right fan. So that for example, let's, let's create a user interface for controlling ventilation, for example, so that you have two fans that you can uh, use to visualize how, how the fans are operating. Um, I already had introduced the data inputs for, for the rotation. And the way that you do a data input that is that you have two different ways. So here we have these uh, data input icons and it says that no input control. By clicking this one, you get a dialogue that you have the possibility to add a new data input. And if you use this way to add the data input, you in, uh, get the correct uh, input data type so that it's vector three type. And this could be the uh, right fan posit position uh, data input and then that is attached to, to that property automatically. Of course, as such, it doesn't do anything. It can be changed, the values can be changed in the, in the viewer to test that this is working. Uh, you can use animations uh, still, so this doesn't have any, any effect on the animations. Um, the other way to look at the data inputs is from the file menu so that you have the data input inputs at, and it gives you the uh, list of all, all data inputs. And here you can see that, for example, this data input that had been created earlier is not in use, so, so the color is white. And these are used somewhere 
in the in the user interface and and then also the input type is different so that this is the range number and and the others are vector three other other types are boolean and float and and strings and for example the range number can be used to control different animation timelines and actually let's take a look at, at that one next so um and from the application side these data inputs can be used uh, to for example create the animation from the application logic so that those can be controlled directly so that you change the x y or z values of the object in the application logic but the other way is to control actually the position in the timeline uh, and as you can see we created the rotation animation here now these both are moving in the in the same same timeline and they have the, exactly the same rotation animation because it was copied of course if i change the animation then the other one is is animating as it used to be and the other one is not but if these if you want to animate these uh, fans independently from each other from the application logic you actually have to create a component uh, of the um, of the uh, object and well let's actually remove the uh, animation from the right fan and then by right clicking on on top of the uh, object you can create a component out of it and what the component means in Q3D Studio is that it has its own timeline of course it has still the rotation and, and position and all this all the basic properties also in the main timeline so that you can do animations for the object uh, in the main timeline but if you click the donut icon on top of the uh, component uh, you can see that now there's a new timeline totally new timeline which is by default 10 seconds um, and then you can create the animation in here uh, and and this is now moving totally independently uh, from the main animation timeline and you can get back onto the main scene and the main timeline uh, by by clicking the uh, breadcrumbs in the in the top of the timeline editor and of course components can have components inside them so that for example if we would like to have this uh, fan object which is the blades inside the fan uh, as a separate component that we would like to control separately we can create the component out of that as well but let's actually look a different way of, of doing the animation from, from the application logic. Um, so if we now play this, um, also the in the viewer, also the uh, right fan animation is running. Uh, and, and then there's a gap in the animation because uh, it's the visibility of the object is, is set to false at some point um, but now these can be controlled uh, in a different uh, in the different timelines so so components are usable for example if you have for example an instrument cluster and you have a for example a speeder meter and you have a needle then you want to control the needle position and the needle animation independently from the cage animation so that for example you can change the location of the whole cage uh, and then animate the needle separately uh, from from the cage animation and uh, 
as said, um, there's the rotation, left fan rotation, uh, data input created here. And if we go into the uh, right fan, uh, we could control this by setting a ranged number to the timeline. So that, uh, for example, we have the right fan rotation, which was the range number already created. And we can see that it's, it's ranging numbers between four, uh, zero and, and 45. Of course, this can be basically anything so that you can define that, okay, this is between one and, and zero, meaning that uh, uh, this is the zero position and, and this is the position one. And then you can interpolate the values uh, between one and zero from the application logic. So, um, and if we jump into the implementation side to take a look how, to, how the QML API works and what you can do with the, with the QML API to change the values. Um, let's hop into the Q creator, let's save the project. So here we have a Qt creator IDE with the small project uh, created for showing the 3D user interface. And basically in the Qt Quick application, what you need to do is to add import for the Qt 3D Studio 2.0. And then you need to create the Studio 3D element, define the scaling, how, how does the, uh, scaling of the 3D UI happens, and then define the presentations, presentation, which is the UIA file that was created. So basically, this is the minimal amount that you need to show the 3D UI. And the other code here is, is for manipulating the data inputs. So that, for example, here we have the data input for the left fan uh, rotation uh, and, uh, and also a color of the left shaft color, which was actually something that I did here. So that, for example, here we have the material and we have the diffuse color and I uh, added a vector three type uh, data input for controlling the, uh, controlling the color. Um, and then um, what we have here is the um, property for controlling the uh, rotation of the whole uh, fan of the left hand. And, and we are making a property binding to a slider component, which is basically a uh, Qt quick control a slider, which is defining values between zero and, and minus 45. So let's actually run this application so that we can see it in action. Okay, now we have a bloom effect that was added into the project, but it's not included. The easiest way to get rid of that is to remove that because we are not using that. Now you can see that uh, 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 the uh, slider is actually hooked into the right uh, right uh, uh, fan rotation values. And and the um, animation that we added here in the main is, is driving the other one. So basically what we can do here is, is to remove that animation when we save the Q3D Studio project, then we 
can see that now the slider is controlling both of these objects. And of course, the reason why they both are moving is that they are using the same, same data binding in the Q3D Studio because I copied the left fan. So basically, what we need to do is to define another, uh, another data input for, for the right, right one. And if we save the project and, and run the application again, now we can see that the, now the other one is driven by the animation and, and this one is driven from the application. So this way you can use, the, for example, the cute controls to uh, change, the, change the content in the 3D UI. Another, another way is to use animations in the QML side. Uh, so that here we have the property animation, um, which is running values from, from zero to 360. Uh, and the du duration is, is 50,000 uh, milliseconds and the animation is infinite. So basically this is changing the values of the, of the blades object, which is the, is the main fan here. And it has also the rotation property and there's the left fan blades rotation uh, data input uh, attached to this one. And the mechanism for activating the uh, Animation is actually done with one of the new features in 2.0 is, is the custom signals from the uh, actions. So that um, if we go to the main scene, you can see an A here in the uh, left hand side, which means that there's an action attached to this object. And if we go into the action um, pane, you can see that the left fan is listening for on pressure down uh, event and then it emits a signal with the name start and stop. So you can use these names to, so, uh, to find the correct signal so that for example if you have a, two different signals for, for a certain object then you can use the name to filter out the correct one. And from the application side, there's an on custom signal emitted uh, signal that is coming from, from the Q3D Studio uh, renderer. And then we can set the fan animation, which is here, the property animation, we can set it to pause, or then we can resume. So that if we run this application, uh, then you can pause the animation by clicking the object. So this is one of the new features with the 2.0. So, so you have the possibility to hook, hook uh, mouse and, and touch events uh, into the application logic. And also you can see here that, uh, for example, the color color of the shaft is changed from the application logic. So basically changing the RGB values of the color, you can change the, uh, you can change the um, color of the, of the 3D object. And of course it's changing also the, also the right fan because uh, it is again using the same same data input um, because the, it was copied. So here we have the, have the shaft object and which has the material object and there you can see that the it's controlled by the left shaft color. So when we remove this one 
and rerun the application now only the only the left one is changed so this is the way that you control the uh, control the 3D UI uh, from the application by using the data inputs. And of course, um, there's a concept called slides, which is basically the user interface states. And um, these slides can be used to, for example, hide stuff or add stuff into the user interface based on the application logic. So that, for example, uh, you could have a situation where there was some additional content and, and then you can place those into the uh, new slide. Or then you could actually, for example, do so that the, uh, the, the, the uh, object is hidden. In, in that slide. And also please remember that the slides are uh, different for, for components. So that scene has its own slides. As you can see that now when we went into the main presentation, you can see that there's only one slide. And, and if you go to the component, you can see that there's actually two slides. So, so these components, slides uh, and animation timelines and, and then the data inputs are really powerful in creating these kind of nested uh, user interfaces with, uh, with, with, with components that have different timelines and different animations. So this is, this is really powerful and versatile functionality. And uh, this was a really short introduction and I was running with quite fast pace. Hopefully you got something out of it. And of course, there's the video recording of this presentation so that you can re rerun it and, and see how different parts were done. And, but let's, let's take a look on the kind of what's coming in the, in the future releases. So, so this is a short roadmap presentation. So we are here at the moment. So we are making the 2.1 release at the moment, which is uh, coming out in September. So what we have been working with is, is improvements in the text rendering in some cases the text is a bit blurry so we are improving that so that it's always crisp in the user interface then we are introducing a support for compressed textures this is especially useful functionality for the embedded devices um, then we are investigating uh, of, of rewriting the way the shaders for the materials and, and post-processing effects are created so so what we are looking at, at is, is uh, creating a shader crafts implementation. And of course, in, in the future, there would be a tool for, for defining materials with the node-based tool so that uh, it's easier to create your custom materials to get the look and feel that you are looking for. Then one thing that we are also investigating is, is to have more configurability on the embedded devices. So that uh, if you have an embedded device that you know that doesn't support certain uh, OpenGL extensions or, or it has poor driver support in, in certain, certain cases. Uh, so you could define a hardware profile that actually would then uh, disable those features uh, that are problematic for the device. So, so this is this is in, an important feature for, especially on the on the low end uh, embedded devices. 
then in the 2.0 release, uh, there's a small uh, usability issue. If you are using sub presentations, uh, which is a uh, feature which allows creating the user interface in different parts. So that for example, if you have an instrument cluster with, uh, with cages and then you have a central part that contains, for example, a music player or, or settings, settings uh, user interface, you can create that settings user interface in a totally different project. And then in the main project, you basically just include that sub presentation. And in the previous or in the, in the current version, it, it's not possible to see, see the uh, sub presentation uh, in the main, main edit view. And that has been already fixed at the moment. And also if you are streaming 2D user interfaces uh, as textures to 3D objects, uh, with the QML stream functionality, then that can be also now seen in, in the edit view. So these are big usability improvements for, for projects using sub presentations or QML streaming. Then in the future releases, there's still a lot of open uh, in, in the content of the releases, but, but basically improving the text handling, uh, introducing tooling for the texture compression, uh, introducing prefabs, which is a functionality for creating uh, basically 3D UI controls so that you could have, for example, the fan could be a prefab that, that you can easily um, add into the project and, and then create different instances of, of the objects. Um, then also continuing on the optimization so that introducing also diagnostics uh, to the uh, designer in the editor view so that you get the basic information about the 3D objects, for example, how, how many vertices they have and how big the textures are. And, and also uh, if there are some unused assets in the project so that making it easier to optimize the presentation during the design time. And also catching up situations where you are, for example, uh, importing a huge texture, which is taking a lot of, lot of processing power from the GPU. And also improving the uh, startup time so that how, how you can control what is loaded first so that, uh, so that the user sees the main user interface as soon as possible, and then you can load the stuff that you don't need in the first startup situation uh, after that. Um, and in the future, further continuing with the, with the optimization for the embedded devices, so that compiling the presentations into the binary format uh, to uh, improve the startup time and then also uh, adding the support for pre-compiled shaders so that uh, that will also improve the startup time. And then we are also uh, investigating the stereoscopic rendering implementation uh, so that uh, customers having stereoscopic screens can, can easily render the view to the stereoscopic screen or by using 3D glasses. And then also we are introducing a, a custom rendering API in the future so that it's, it's easier to, for example, add 3D objects from the application logic side. So at the moment, uh, the Q3D Studio is, is uh, mainly operating on the uh, 3D objects that are included in the, in the, uh, presentation. But uh, as the kind of content of future releases is of course uh, a bit changing based, based on the feedback that we are receiving. And a short recap of 
documentation included in the in the tool itself so basically you have the help menu here so that you can uh, open the reference manual which is included in the installation or it's available also online so so there's the getting started documentation and and then the whole documentation for the api and how to use the editor is is also available online then we are writing blog posts about how to use the q3d studio some tips and tricks and then examples are available in the examples folder under the installation directory and additional uh, examples can be found in this uh so this was a short introduction to the to the tool and a special focus on the on the new features introduced in the 2.0 so if you have some questions um, you can put those into the QA session and, and we can take a look with Tommy so um, there's one question uh, related to anchoring so that uh, is it possible to anchor 2d items cute quick on on 3d elements in the q3d studio um, so at the moment only mechanism for for anchoring stuff between the 2d and 3d uh, view is basically using the QML streaming uh, so so if you have 2d UI and then want to uh, anchor that some, uh, somehow into the 3D scene, then you can use the uh, QMO streaming functionality. But, but it's not the same kind of mechanism as you have in, in Qt Quick. Uh, then there's a question, how can I use a video, ca video or camera stream as a scene background? And by using the QML streaming functionality. Um, so defining a camera uh, output in a QML application and then putting that into a QML stream and then an object visible. Do we have any additional questions? Please put those into the Q&A. Yeah, I think that's it for the moment. We'll wait for a little bit longer in case someone's typing. It for, for today. Well, I think that might be all the questions we have. Um, if you do have any more questions we didn't go through or uh, think of them later on, please send us an email at info at cute.io and we'll answer them for you then. Uh, but until then, thank you, for much for, thank you so much for joining uh, and great day.